it's a lot easier to win good work when you're doing good work. Success breeds success. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I had the great honor of speaking with an architectural lighting designer, founder of Nolte, Paul Nolte. Nolte was originally founded in London and is an award-winning lighting design consultancy renowned for delivering immersive lighting projects for huge global brands such as Nike, Samsung, Harrods, Bloomingdale's and Burberry. And they've got an international footprint spanning Europe, the US, the Middle East and North Africa. And Nolte has implemented and sustained a client expansion plan to bolster its global presence and cultivate client relationships throughout the world. And what I really loved about this conversation with Paul was that he is or embodies that entrepreneurial spirit that we really love and enjoy here at Business of Architecture. And he discusses about how when he first set up the practice, he really focused on sales and marketing and implementing systems and how that has freed him up to do the work that he loves and how it has created a business that is both sustainable, profitable and impactful. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Paul Nolte. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Paul, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Pleasure to see you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So you are the founder, director of Paul Nolte Lighting Design Consultants. You guys have got work all over the world, London, Dubai, Beirut, Miami, Bangkok, all the glamorous locations and you <laughs> you've, just my holiday <laughs> <laughs> and you've, you've got a really Im- impressive you know set of clients with um, big name brands large infrastructure organizations i suppose the first question really is is, is could you take us back to you know the the genesis of the business and kind of lead us through how it started um almost by accident, it's probably fair to say. Um, yeah, so we are we're coming up to our 10th birthday um, early next year, in 2021. Mm. So we started in 2011. Um, I've got a wonderful photograph that my team are probably fed up of me willing out once a year at the, you know, the staff away day. But it's, it's of me sitting on my dining room table. So we started from, I mean, literally from the dining room table, um, mm. just myself with my first business plan, which said, uh, I just want to pay my mortgage this year. Uh, and we very quickly grew from that. And we, you know, we took on our first kind of employee and then second and third. And, and then it just very quickly snowballed. And my, my original business plan probably went out the window after about the first six months. So it's, it was a, a really good start. Um, but I think a lot of that start was built upon you know, several years of working for other lighting design practices and mm. learning what to do and what not to do and how to differentiate. Um, so part of that journey really, especially in the early days, was about being different and offering something different uh, and coming to the market in a different way, which is interesting, especially as a designer, because you're not, well, I'm not, you know, I wasn't. Designers are not really taught how to market and brand and um, promote themselves you know, beyond that, that sort of initial uh, layer of network that they may or may not have had. Uh, to farm, uh, to farming um, existing clients. So, mm. um, so it, for us, you know, we, we came to the marketplace a little differently, and we, and we grew very, very quickly. And I think we're something like fifty strong, just over fifty people um, at the moment uh, across the five offices. So, um, yeah, it's been an interesting roller coaster of ten years. Fantastic. Um, and just, as far as ups and downs go, you know, it's 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 been tough at times, particularly now. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, just to set the scene a little bit, um, you know, lighting design is an industry or discipline that's kind of, it could be considered quite new um, mm. in the construction world of construction and, and in architecture and related uh, fields. How would you describe what it is that you do and how does it fit into 
uh, well, particularly how does it fit into the rest of the architectural delivery process? Or yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, technically speaking, lighting design as an art form or as a discipline has probably been around sort of 60 to 70 years, around, yeah. around that. Um, but it's always been on the periphery and a bit of a cottage industry, and it's probably only in the last 25 years that it's really started to become its own sort of outright independent um, profession that's almost at the sort of same level or at least around the same table as architecture and interior design and project yeah. management and engineering. So it's an industry that's still relatively sort of infantile uh, and it is, it is growing um, very quickly. I mean, if I look at the number of lighting design practices in the UK now, I think it's, it's probably sort of pushing 200 practices. So it's, it is very much an evolving industry. I mean, lighting design sits somewhere in between architecture, interior design, landscape design, engineering, mm. or the electrical engineering side of things. Because light and lighting design is, it sits at this sort of beautiful juncture of, of creativity and technology. It's our job to make sure things are legal. So, you know, we have to hit the right quantity of light where it's required, and it's assisting architects and designers to, to make sure that whatever the space is, is obviously illuminated to a safe and, and well-being uh, way or you know, to, to levels that, that are compliant. But the art of good lighting design is so much more than that because actually it's, it's this sort of emotional um, relationship that we're trying to elicit between the space, whatever that space is, the architecture, and the people that use it. Our primary sense is obviously sight, um, arguably, um, it's sight. And therefore, what we see is entirely uh, derived from the quality of light that we have in a space. Yeah. And how we therefore react to that is, is um, sort of relative to, to the quality of light in the space as well. So, so for me, you know, architectural lighting design is all about the currency of emotion and mm. getting people to enjoy the space and react to that space. So it's much more than the electrical engineering. And your electrical engineers can tell you how much light to put into a space. Yeah. Your electrician can probably go and choose you some light fittings if you really want. The interior designer can probably go and choose a nice chandelier and the, the, the tangible stuff, the actual luminaires themselves. And architects, not to want to alienate an audience, you know, are very good at doing beautiful arrays of light fittings and everything lines up really lovely on a two-dimensional drawing. Um, but what they all sort of suffer from is, is understanding the, the invisible stuff, which yeah. you know, is light. You don't see light, you see the surface that light interacts with. So lighting design is all about um, understanding how light falls upon a surface. And mm. if I was being a bit pompous, I suppose I could say it's as much about being a dark designer right. as it is about being a lighting designer because you don't have light without dark. Yes. So it's that, that sort of marriage of both of those. And of course, the good lighting designer will, will then sit you know, around a table with the architectural design team and we will collaborate and uh, evolve the scheme. And a good designer should be able to elevate the overall ex design experience and the overall mm. experience of those using the space to, to a much higher level than if we were not involved. So um, you know, the role of the lighting designer is very much about engaging the end users right. with that space. How do you then, obviously with the, with the clients that you're, you're working with, how do they know to hire a lighting designer mm. and, and half of them don't right <laughs> you know that's the challenge it's still a relatively young industry we are we are considered you know, yet another consultancy you know my god i've already got an employer an mup consultant and a security consultant and an it consultant and a vertical transportation consultant and we you know kitchen consultants why on earth do i want to employ yet another consultant you know around the table but the truth is it is becoming a real specialism because technology is evolving so quickly. Right. Um, and the rules and regulations are also evolving incredibly quickly. So staying on top of that is becoming a specialism, certainly in terms of, of lighting. You tend to find uh, once a client has worked with an independent designer, uh, an independent lighting designer, they will always want to work with an independent lighting designer because they suddenly start to understand the art of, of design. Um, but it can be quite challenging sometimes because it's, it's, you're asking somebody to sign off on a fee for something they don't see. You know, it's something completely yeah. intangible mm. and it is incredibly subjective. 
you know, the whole point about light is, you know, everybody has a different emotional response. Um, everybody has an opinion. Uh, and therefore it becomes incredibly subjective. And because we're into the realms of creativity, it isn't as black and white, it isn't a tick box exercise. You know, a lot of developers like to come up with sort of boxes to tick in terms of lighting, but they, they talk very much about the quantity of light that's required in the space, but not about the quality. And the mm -hmm. quality is about perception um, and emotional response, which is entirely personal and subjective. So it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough challenge, to be honest. Um, um, so, uh, face every day. looking at your, you know, your very impressive client list, um, clearly you guys have, are getting something very right in terms of being able to make a, uh, an economic case for this almost ephemeral kind of design yeah. aspect that you're bringing to the buildings. How do you go about doing that? What are the sorts of things that you, you measure or, or? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good way of looking at it. You know, what are the economic um, benefits, I suppose, of working with a, with a lighting designer. Well, apart from the fact that a good lighting designer knows where to procure products um, right. better and therefore uh, more cost effectively, so there's a, there's a capital expenditure saving. Um, there's also things like savings on um, energy consumption. So we've worked with one client who came to us and said we want to cut 20% of the energy off of our estate. We work with them over a year and we end up, um, I think it's about 40%. Uh, saving in the end so you know they, they were a retailer with something like 200 stores so you know there's almost a million pounds uh, energy saving they had per, per annum it's a huge uh, energy saving um so you know the economic benefits are just you know immediately are there but then when we talk to developers if you're you know developer building a lovely new um tower for example and it's a uh, it's a tower for speculative office developments well you bring in a a specialist lighting designer, there's a good chance that's that floor space or that building may be let a bit quicker right. or you may get a few more quid per, per square foot as well because the quality of the space is better. Um, so it, it all sort of feeds into that. So it's very difficult to say, well, it's, you know, you've got this, this lighting system, it's now an extra five pounds per square foot. Right. But if it lets the space a lot quicker, and believe me, we're, we're going into an era now where I think lettings are going to be quite tough mm. right now as people are, are adjusting to you know, working from home, for example. Um, I think anything that developers can bring to the table to make a space more competitive you know, in, in that marketplace, then, then the better. You know, we've worked some very shrewd developers that have done just that and um and let space very very quickly as a result so i think there are a number of different economical benefits um to good quality lighting over and beyond just the experience that somebody has in that space mm. and, and it, i suppose as well that there's a, a, a question around particularly again looking looking at some of the very strong predefined brands that you're working with you know some of, some of the retails or some of the hospitality clients that you've worked with um that there's an your the services that you're producing as well are kind of enhancing that brand experience how, mm -hmm. how do you how do you integrate that into your design well yeah i mean again brand experience is it's particularly prevalent in retail it's easy to kind of single it out because it's, yeah you know if you want to go and buy a pair of nikes you can go and buy them online these days so why would you bother going into a store so it, it, <clears throat> we talk about bricks going towards clicks because people are moving away from the high street so the challenge for the high street is how you go from clicks back to bricks you know how do i get people back in store mm. well that has to be much more experiential yeah. so if you're a nike or you're an apple you've got to be so clear about what your brand is and what your brand messaging is that the overall in-store experience has to um sort of reaffirm and, and underline what that, whatever that brand messaging is. So if you want to go and buy a pair of Nikes, for example, then you go and you want to try them on. So you want to go and get on a treadmill or you want to go and kick a football up against a wall and install. Um, or if it's Apple, it's about communication and community. So they've started building in sort of amphitheaters into store, for example. Um, it becomes, um, you know, lighting becomes this sort of one of many tools that we use to, un to underline and enhance that brand experience. It's very easy. But then you can take that beyond the retail experience because hospitality, you know, is, is very much about underlining the brand. If it's a Mandarin Oriental, it's dark, it's moody, it's dramatic, it's very mm -hmm. theatrical. Light and dark have a sort of key role to play in that. Um, and then you can almost 
um, then start to shift that into the corporate world as well. So if you are uh, a particular corporate brand, let's pick one for, uh, for example, um, let's, let's say it's insurance company A and you've got, uh, you know, 3,000 people that work for you in your, your headquarters building. And you know, each one of those staff has the potential to move to another business. So if you want to retain your staff, you've got to give them much better quality space. Yeah. And then when we start talking about better quality space, then you've got to figure out, well, how does that reflect the brand that you work for? So that particular bank might be a German bank, for example. They might have particular German values. How does the lighting and the overall spatial experience reflect that uh, whilst also doing its best to keep staff happy? Um, and then there are lots of other things we can do in the corporate workplace um, in terms of... Um, uh, using light to um, enhance hormone or, or suppress hormone production to keep people more alert and awake or, wow. or, or you know, help them um, in the post-lunch lull. And equally, <laughs> in, in the hospitality world, we can do the same thing. You know, if you turn up with jet lag, we can put more blue light in and try and um, sort of help um, sort of allay some of that, that jet lag. We can't get rid of all of it, but we can certainly help um, with, with sort of easing the journey. So, yeah. It really depends on the kind of brand that you are and the kind of messaging that you have and the kind of people that you are trying to connect to. Light it has this sort of amazing power to reach sort of um, nooks and crannies of people's world that you didn't even understand or didn't even realize. Mm. Um, and going back you know, to retail, ultimately it can help them sell more products. Amazing. And retailers are afterwards. So it's after. So it's, it's a big challenge, but there's an awful lot we're sort of wrapped up in this world of light. Yeah, uh, that you can do. So. Uh, how? Uh, what's the process then for you to uh, win new work? Then to be working with some of these major name brands were these mm. brands that you you initially started working off when you were still you know kind of on, at the kitchen table, or did it evolve slowly? What was the, um, the sequence of events? It's a lot easier to win good work when you're doing good work. Yeah. And I think any architect the world over will tell you that, you know, um, success breeds success. So it's really hard when you start off. You know, when I started, it was very difficult getting a toe in the door. One of the first projects I ever worked on was um, Manchester United's stadium store. Yeah. And it was a retail space. <clears throat> and we were quite brave with that space because normally a, a football stadium store is very light and bright because they have huge amounts of match day traffic and lots of people stealing stuff and things. Um, but we said to them that you know, this, this space could be quite dark and moody and fun, mm. but we can still get good light where it's required. It doesn't mean it's a sort of blanket illuminating everything. Um, and it became quite an award-winning space at the end of it. So um, there's a really interesting design that, that sort of evolved football stadium um, store design on a little bit. So from a lighting perspective, it, it went a very long way. And I do know their sales increased by, by quite a considerable percentage that... I'd probably have to shoot you if I told you exactly what the figure was, but it was a success. So I know, I know that much. So um, economically, there was a benefit to doing it as well. Um, yeah. But I mean, how do you go about winning those clients? Well, I mean, the, the first few clients were you know, small projects and it was a case of proving ourselves and then making sure that whatever we were doing, we were marketing and, and telling the world, you know, it doesn't matter how good a designer you are. If you don't tell the world you're mm. doing good work, nobody's going to know. Um, and I think it is about looking at, this sort of network of connections that we all have and thinking of them as like an onion, lots of different layers and layers of people. And you know, most designers tend to stick within that sort of first few layers. And I think I always look to the outer layers, but well, it's great that you and you know who we are, but what about you and you that have never heard of us? How do we reach you and, and tell you what our, our story is as, as a business? Um, and you know, how do we excite you enough to want to work with us? Yeah. And that's the challenge. How did you manage to navigate yourself out of the inner layers of the onion into the outer layers of, uh, of your network? I winged it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, there's no, no denying it. You know, we made it up as we went along. We were very pushy. Uh, we made sure we had a really good elevator pitch and a really good kind of backstory to why we were doing what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And I went out and I told it to anyone and everybody that would listen. And I did lots of stuff like this. You know, uh, I did lots of talking at um, conferences and seminars, and we pulled together a CBD program that we went and gave to um, uh, architects and interior designers. And we just made really sort of clear that, that we had a strong kind of thought leadership pattern and, and that we were positioning ourselves as, as market leaders. And, mm. and 
I say we, we got our story right and we knew what people, I mean, it's sort of horrible management spiel, so I apologise to the designers, but, you know, we made sure we knew what the people that we wanted to work with needed from us and we made sure then that we were pitching it in, in that way. And, mm. uh, and it helped that we, we started off working on retail projects because they're very fast turnover projects, which meant it gave us some kind of collateral to go and promote. Yeah. But actually, you know, retail now is probably 10% of what we do. You know, a lot of what we do is public realm, hospitality, corporate workplace, um, a little bit of um, sort of local governmental work as well. So it's a very diverse portfolio. So that gives you, you know, if it's a diverse portfolio, it also gave us a lot of people to go and talk to. I mean, even now, I complain to my team that we're not reaching enough people with, with the message that, that we want. And um, I think part of the challenge we now face 10 years on is to make sure that lighting design as an industry is being taken more seriously yeah. and, and being um, a consultant that is a must have, not a nice to have. Yeah. Um, and part of that is about educating. Um, one of the challenges we face as lighting, as independent lighting designers, is that other people try and offer the same. So we get a lot of electrical engineering practices offering lighting design services, which isn't bar, you know, bar two or three engineering firms the rest aren't really offering a proper creative design service. They just kind of they'll uh, sort of engineer up and detail up whatever the architect wants, but not really challenge it. Mm. Um, equally, you know, the electricians or, or there are people like design suppliers or manufacturers that will also uh, try and do design, but it's not really design. That tends to be about shifting boxes. Exactly. And they, you know, design suppliers and, and manufacturers won't um, absorb design responsibility. So if you don't like it, then it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not theirs. Whereas with an independent lighting designer, you know, we, we you know, have a, a very high level of PI and we, we are responsible for all things light and lighting and uh, anything associated with that lighting design. So um, it's very different when we own it because we're taking responsibility and it's our job to make sure that it's, um, you know, we'll, our job to make sure we are making the, the architect and interior designer and the rest of the design team's lives as easy as possible. Um, whilst elevating the scheme. So it's, it's getting all of that story right and then being able to, to articulate it in the right way to the right people. We work very hard on our social media. Um, you know, we're, we're one of the first lighting practices, I think, really, to look at all of those kind of streams of marketing and, and to try and professionalise it mm. rather than us being a kind of a cottage industry that was feeding people's lifestyles, you know, or hobbies. Um, you know, it's really about trying to professionalise it where possible. Um, <laughs> And I think there were some very good people out there that were forerunners uh, to us. And we've sort of just tried to pick up that baton uh, and push it even further. Where, where does your experience with uh, marketing and your, your know-how of leading kind of these marketing efforts, where does that come from? Because obviously that's not something that's in the, in the typical remit of, of us yeah. as, as designers. And it's very clear that you, you're, you've got a deep understanding of it and you're kind of being very proactive with it. And, you know, and it's evident from the, you know, the growth of the business. Was that something that's you've always it. been interested in, or? I'm. That's what I'm interested in. It's actually the reason I'm a lighting designer. I'm interested in the conversation we have as human beings with other human beings. Yeah. I'm a people watcher. If I'm on the tube, I will sit there and I will, to my detriment at the time, stare at people because I know <laughs> and, and listen to people's conversations. Um, I've always been interested in in people and, and the way that they react. And then I think I got into lighting design and what I was interested in was people's relationship with the space and the conversation they have with the space. And that's actually, I, my background is theatre design and originally I started off as a set designer. Right. And I was interested in that kind of creating that, that environment and that space for people to react to and to the suspension of disbelief or, or suspension of belief um, and getting people involved. And then I started stripping away the set and ended up with more and more light-based Kind of space and creating space with light but I was very much interested in that relationship and I think my interest in branding and marketing really just simply, it simply stems from that is that you know, all branding and marketing is is the conversation you're having with a business mm. that's it it's as simple as that and if your business is having the right conversation with the right people then it'll do well and that's why there are some amazing retailers out there that are doing incredibly well in a, in a very difficult time because they're having the right conversations. Um, and it's why some retailers are, are really struggling at the moment. And it's, you know, on the design industry, it's why you have some amazing designers failing. 
Yes. You know, some of the most talented creative designers, but they can't pitch themselves. You know, yeah. they're, they're so focused on whatever their particular discipline is. Um, so I think the short answer to your question is it's all about relationships. Mm. And I love the relationships people have with stuff and people. Yeah. That's a really eloquent way of describing it and describing marketing and branding as a conversation that you are continually having with with other people about your about your business and your and your services. And it's not, you know, often particularly in design, you know, I speak with a lot of architects and sometimes um, and other sorts of uh, creatives as well, where sales and marketing is seen as something dirty or something that we shouldn't be doing. I mean, I've, yeah. I have even had architects say to me, you know, we shouldn't be doing marketing you know wish we had brokers that would do it all for us which is all yeah great but if you're running a business it's kind of it's the engine if you like of, of finding new work and if you're yeah, able totally. to relate to it like you like you just described as an extension of your design process as well then it becomes mm. a much sort of uh, deeper process it, it has to be what i think motivated me when i years ago when i was working for somebody else I attended a, um, one of those kind of management conferences that are really boring and everybody switches off, you know. Um, but the guy drew one model, one business model that just stuck. Mm. And he drew um, a grid of four squares. And he said, in the top square, you have human resources. In uh, the top right-hand square, you have operations. In the you know, bottom square, bottom right-hand square, you have finance. And then in the bottom left hand square, you have business development. And he said, you can have the best people, you know, best HR in the world, but if you haven't got the work, then you're going to go bust. Yeah. Uh, you, can have, you can be doing the best work in the world with the best people, but if you're not getting the money in, your finance operation isn't right, you're going to go bust. You can have an amazing finance operation, amazing people, and be doing amazing work, but if you're not telling anybody, then you've got no work coming through the door, you're going to go bust. Um, and I think one of the, well, one of the first companies I ever worked for went bust and I swore to God, <laughs> I swore to myself, I, I'm never going to go there. So I think that really stuck with me. So I've always made sure that as a business leader or owner, mm. um, I've tried to work on all four of those pillars yeah. essentially. And I think it's really important that you do. And it's really easy for us when we go off and train to be architects or designers in, in whatever capacity to say, well, I'm a designer, I just do design work. Well, that's fine, but is there anybody else in the business that's doing the other three pillars? Because if not, then, then things are gonna fall over very quickly. Yeah. And particularly with the architects we work with, we see their workloads often be very spiky. You know, they'll win a project, they'll be flat out working on that project probably for two or three years, and then suddenly the project will finish, and they'll have no other work. And then they have to go out and do BD, and then the work comes in again, and they go through the same cycle. Yes. And we see that quite a lot. And actually the reason I think a lot of the, the larger architecture practices do very well is because they've got con people continuously do, you know, working in all four of those uh, pillars, um, which mm. means that the machine is always being fed. And I think we as a, an industry, as a construction design industry, have to accept that at the end of the day, it is a conveyor belt. Work is coming in at one end and it's going out the other end, and we're all part of that machine and it's a horrible way of looking at it because we all want to be creative but that's the truth you know it's not a hobby for most of us you know it is it's a job or it's a career and it's mm. um, we've got to make some money out of it in some capacity and you're absolutely right because we're all trying to be creative thinkers anything to do with money marketing sales it's all this dirty horrible um stuff that none of us want to get involved with but if um, if you're into business, then frankly, you've you've got to you've got to do it, yeah. Or at least get somebody better than you to do it. Absolutely. How how do you um, manifest those four pillars in your own in your own business? Is it something that you 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 do, and do you still get to design or? I, I was. It's been an interesting journey for me. So in the beginning, I started out. It was me. I was doing it all. Yeah. I had um, this wonderful woman called Catherine, who was my finance director and i say that with um since speech marks because Catherine didn't really exist she was just an email address <laughs> but what would happen is i would do work and clients wouldn't pay because you know clients view is the money's always better off in their account rather than mine of course <laughs> and i found it really difficult asking people for money even though i've done the work i found it really hard saying to somebody you know what we've done the work um you know in fence could you please pay us 
And of course, you'd be really pally with them because you want to keep them, you know, keep them good terms because you want more money. And I found it really difficult. So I, I invented this, this lovely lady called Catherine, who was a complete Rottweiler. And she would send very stroppy emails uh, to clients. And then the client would probably send a fairly terse email back. And then I was able to step in as Paul, being the good cop, saying, you know, dear Mr. Client, I'm really sorry that Catherine's being quite a Rottweiler, but your invoice is now six months late. Um, you know, we have done the work in good faith. If you could please see your way to, to it being paid, we'd appreciate it. Um, so Catherine became a bit of a mainstay. Um, and she's a, a bit of a, a, a kind of an ongoing joke in the office, I suppose. Because, <laughs> you know, but obviously, we don't have a Catherine anymore. Um, but as we've grown, you know, the, probably the biggest and scariest decision I ever made was to, um, was to employ my first ever PA come office manager. Right. Because it was the first non-fee earning person. I think we were five people maybe. This is the person number six in the team. And I was frankly driving myself mad trying to do all the kind of admin stuff and you know, struggling and wanting to do design. So bringing in office manager was a godsend because it suddenly gave me time just to go and do business development stuff with clients and design work. And then we went through a really, it was great for a few years actually. And then we went through a really tough period. We got to about 20 people and we weren't working in teams. We were just, you know, I was insistent that everybody had to work with everybody internally so they could all learn from each other. And it was really difficult. And I found myself just running around, not doing any design work, but just yeah. fighting fires and dealing with stuff. And it was only when we organized ourselves into teams and we accepted that we actually needed you know, proper specialists, a finance director. You know, to come in and, and do stuff, and then we bought PR and marketing in house. So I stopped writing press releases, and we, we got somebody in to do it. So I think it was, there was a, an acknowledgement uh, that I needed good people that were better than me. I mean, my, my business plan these days is is to be the worst person in the business at everything. That's my goal. Um, you know, I know that I'm pretty good at most things. I've got a foot in most camps there, in those four mm. pillars we try and train our staff from the get-go. If you come in as a, um, an intern, you still have access to all of our fee proposals. You know, people have access to everything. We're very open. Uh, I'm determined that we are going to train, you know, sort of the, um, all of our designers to be commercially aware, creative uh, yeah. designers with, a, with a, a real lean towards customer service as well. Um, so the team are, are sort of ingrained, that's ingrained in some, from the, from the get go. Um, and that's part of our business culture, I suppose. Um, and as I say, if I'm then ensuring that each person that, um, comes into the team is either better than what we have or has the potential to be better than what we have, then it mm. means we continuously evolve and grow as a business. Um, so it's really important. I guess the short answer to your, your question is, is, is that it's important to ingrain the company culture in everybody. Yeah. It comes through the door from the get-go and to accept that as a business owner we can't do it all and therefore you have to trust and let go and that is really scary at times well, well, well that that is often one of the hardest things for many designers to do is to relinquish the kind of wanting to do everything and controlling everything um yeah. and kind of you know as you say hiring somebody else who's more skilled than you how did you manage to to let go what were the was it, were you able to identify if you, if you didn't do this, was this, this was going to cause problems or? Well, I mean, there's a lovely um, kind of end to that story, which is nowadays I do more design than I've done in years. It's great. <laughs> you know, and, and I love it. And I actually get to do the fun stuff, which is like the conceptual stuff and then a bit of the detailing and cause chaos for the rest of the team. And they go away and kind of make it all happen. They able to make mm -hmm. it happen. Um, but how did I kind of get back to that? Um, yeah, it's hard, and there's an element of some of my team, my managing director in particular, sort of wrestling with me occasionally, just you know, over, over stuff. Um, and I had to learn. I had to learn that actually, um, sometimes it's okay to trust. Yeah. And I, I think the key thing I've learned over the years is that we may not all do things the same way. But if we have the same common goal, the same end goal for every project as a team, then, okay, maybe you wouldn't write, oh, I wouldn't write a report in exactly that way or I wouldn't you know, deliver it in exactly that way. That's okay. So yeah. long as we're meeting the same standards, the same vision that we as a business have, and we're all in agreement over that, 
then I'm okay with it because that allows the designers within our practice to be individual designers, um, but delivering to a consistent standard, which is really what we're about. And it's a consistent standard of design and service. So it's, it's scary, you know, letting go and saying, okay, you're going to run this project and I'm not going to get necessarily too heavily involved with it. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not going to red pen that document. Somebody else is going to red pen it. Um, so it's, it, it's got easier. It's definitely got easier, but, um, it's, it's definitely a challenge. How, how would you describe your role now, nowadays then? Well, my team would describe me as pain in the ass <laughs> <laughs> in a nice way. I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my role these days, it's sort of the face of the business. Um, ultimately I'm there as mentor to the team. Mm. Um, I'm there to help where necessary, I'm there to guide. I would always consider myself to be not, uh, although I suppose the captain of the ship, I would consider myself probably to be more like the rudder. You know, I'm not necessarily deciding where we go, either at a design level on a project or as a, at a kind of a larger business level, but I'm sure as hell gonna help guide us to wherever we as a team decide that we're going to go to. So it's kind of leading from the back, not the front. Yeah. Um, it's my job to make sure everybody else does their job. I mean, in, in the it's sort of easiest um, description, I suppose. Mm. That, that's what I mean. I, and I love it because it means I get to do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and I get to do some really fun design stuff. And then get, you know, the team get to go and take that and, and evolve it and develop it and then uh, and deliver. So, Amazing. Uh, you, yeah. you mentioned earlier, you used the phrase customer service. And mm. I pick up on that because it's not a phrase that I would often hear from designers. And yeah. it's, it excites me that, that that's part of your business culture is to be, is to be focusing on the, you know, the, the, the experience, the customer service that we give to our clients. For you, how do you, what, what does that comprise of? What sorts of things are you, are you keen to have your business developers in terms of their customer service yeah so so many so many levels to this answer the, the, so the high level answer is never look after the project look after the people associated with the project so if you are my client i'm going to do my best to keep you in the loop and communicate with you on, on everything i've got to do the best to take you on the design journey um I'm going to get you to buy into the narrative that we're developing. I'm going to take you all the way on that journey. And I'm going to look after you in the best possible way that I can. Um, and I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to tell you when I'm doing it. And then I'm going to tell you that I have done it. So if that's a, a pack of drawings, then I'm going to tell you we're going to be doing the pack of drawings on Monday. We're going to be delivering them on Tuesday. And then come Tuesday, I'm going to ring you up and say, we've delivered them for you. So you're going to know all the way along that journey what we've been delivering. I think where a lot of designers and architects go wrong is they look after the project, not the people. Yeah. So that means you end up working in isolation. You end up doing your drawing package and you may have a deadline for Thursday and you're, you know, you're, you're head down and you're working away on it. But if nobody else in the design team knows that you're delivering that by Thursday, everybody starts to ask questions. And the moment the client brings you up and says, oh, I just want to check, are you going to deliver that on Thursday? You're immediately on the back foot because they've had to call you up. So you should have been proactive and told them what you were going to do in the first place. Yeah. So for me, service is all about communication and taking people on the journey, whatever it is, without being a complete pain in the bum. You know, it's just, um, you know, it can't be a hindrance to people. But mm. at the same time, you've got to take them on that journey so that so they buy into what you're delivering as, as much as anything else. So, so customer service is key. Um, it's a horrible analogy, but I'll give it to you anyway. It's like going into a restaurant, right? If your dinner's going to be late, you order your, your food and you have to ask for the menu because the waiter didn't deliver it. That's going to annoy you. Yeah. And then you order your food. And if the waiter doesn't come and tell you when it's coming and it's going to be a bit late, that's going to annoy you as well. But if the waiter comes over and says, look, I'm really sorry, but we can't deliver this you know, now, but be another 20 minutes, at least you know what's going on. And that journey and that, that, that experience tends to be a lot better. Um, so for me, it's all about communication and everybody all the way through, because it's really easy for a junior designer to hide and say, oh, it's not my project. I'm just delivering the drawing package. Mm. It's really easy to, and it's, it's not acceptable. You know, everybody in the team has to communicate all the way up. And it's about managing up and down the chain of command. 
um, not just down. You know, so, 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 so with some of the, um, the junior team members, um, how do you encourage them to be communicating? Do they, do they have, when you say, talk about customer service, are they having any kind of direct um, contact with the clients or is it more communicating to the other members of the team? It's, at junior level, it's usually to the other members of the team. Yep. I think it's, it's also important to have one point of communication with, with the end client, ultimately. You don't want to muddy the waters. Yeah. But if you, you, know, if you happen to be, you mentioned Grimshaw earlier, if you're working with Grimshaw and they've got you know, 10 people of varying levels, well, at some point, the juniors are going to talk to the juniors or the intermediates to the intermediates. And I think it's really important that everybody is involved in that. And I also think it's, it's, involved, it's important for the evolution of our designers to be able to do that because you learn things. You, know, you take a junior to a meeting, yeah, okay, they're not necessarily gonna to contribute a huge amount, but actually they're gonna sit there and listen and absorb and learn. And they're where you really learn about how projects run. You know, go and sit in front of a difficult contractor. That's where you really learn the nitty gritty of a project and what works and what doesn't work on a project. You know, it's not in a classroom. Um, so we try and encourage our designers to get out as often as possible, get along to as many meetings as possible. Um, it's obviously difficult with tight deadlines, of course, but we, we try and do that as part of the training and part of the evolution. Um, you know, I don't think you can just graduate from university and suddenly come in as a senior designer. And I think we do see a few, uh, a few designers do think that. They think, oh, I've got a you know, my master's in light and lighting, and therefore I must be a senior designer. It's like, no, your, your training now begins. Yeah. You know, um, it's, it's a bit like becoming a Jedi master, I suppose. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, your training begins now. Uh, but that's what it's about. And it's about delivering service and, and understanding, you know. I always say the mark of any good company, no matter who it is, is, is how they react when things go wrong. Because mm. we can all be good when it's all going really well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're up against it and you're going to miss a deadline, it's how you let people know or something didn't quite work in the design or something got missed. It's about how that all gets picked up and, and, um, and serviced ultimately. So, uh, you know, I'm sorry to say it to the creatives listening, but to be a successful designer, whether it's product designer, lighting designer, architect, it's got to be about more being more than a creative yeah, and that's that's what it's about. I love it. Um, it, you were saying, you know, part of the customer service, the customer experience, is being able to be, you know, really clearly communicate all through the process about when things are to be expected, and now we've delivered this, and you know, you know, you're kind of being your word all through the process. Whereas many designers can go off into their into their own worlds and just be burrowing away, busy, 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 doing lots of iterations. <clears throat> and you know, my in my experience, and I've spoken to um, certain designers before in the past about okay well you know uh, setting up a clear set of expectations particularly over time and delivery with clients is, is super crucial and often designers might say well we don't know how long it's going to take yet mm. this is where we're concerned about this how how have you managed to be able to um, foresee how long things will take and what sorts of things behind the scenes are happening to ensure that you're able to deliver on time with um, the deadlines well the short answer is we're like a beautiful swan <laughs> <laughs> graceful on top and paddling like buggery on top. <laughs> um no it, look, it's easy for us with sub consultants right. so often by the time we're involved in the project uh the architect is already appointed and has probably been for quite a while so there is probably a program already set out so we're signing up to that so for us it's a little easier it's prescribed um, what I would say is that we increasingly see less time allocated for thinking, uh, which is something you just said, you know, there, um, I think clients value good design. They don't necessarily value that space that it takes mm. to evolve good design. Um, you know, I often go to meetings and, you know, I, I walk in thinking it's a briefing meeting. And then somebody's sitting there thinking, you know, expecting me to design there and then on the spot. Um, <clears throat> and, and that can be really difficult yeah. because you need to go away and digest and develop itera iterations for sure. And even as a you know, sub-discipline like lighting, light and lighting, we still have to do that. So it is, it is a challenge, but you know, often 99% of the time we're signing up to something with a pre pre prescribed 
program, so we know what we're getting ourselves into. Um, in the Middle East, my office in Dubai, it's particularly difficult. You know, we've had projects where they've said, look, we want concept and schematic design for a five-star hotel in, in four weeks. Can you do it? And you think, this is going to be a lot of late nights. Um, <laughs> and there is a school of thought. You know, I hear if there are um, sort of management, business management consultants listening, the advice they always say is, well, you have to educate your clients. You have to push back. You have to say no. Uh, because the moment you say yes, it'll always be expected. And I, I, I hear that. But the reality of it is also we want to get paid and we need the work. And, mm. you know, sometimes you just have to, to, to maintain a relationship. You have to just sign up to some really tough deadlines. And sometimes that can be an imposition on a design team. Yeah. Um, and there can be a few grumblings occasionally. That's life. But we deliver and we deliver to the end goal. And uh, if we have a happy client and the client wants to work with us, then, then good. Um, you know, but sure programs don't necessarily mean small fees is what i would say right you, know, you yes. can have it fast but you can't necessarily have it cheap yeah yeah um so I, I think that's also important to remember as well but um uh it is a little easier for us than it would be say for an architectural practice you know i, I well, where, accept that you, you were you're saying that you you know you, your position as a sub consultant and you will come in a little bit later into the projects where exactly is the sort of ideal position for you to come in and, and is there a danger that you can come in too early and what's the impact of that on a project or can you come in too late um it's never too late right. I mean, it's never you know, the later it is the harder it is obviously because stuff's decided you know i think we have to get past thinking of lighting as a kind of commodity product it's just a down lights so we're just going to stick them in i just need to get the lighting designer in just to tell me where to put the down lights the ceiling acne, well, wasn't it? You described. Yeah, ceiling acne. Yeah, <laughs> lots of spots in the ceiling. You know, so it's it's uh, we've got to get beyond this. It's it's beyond the tangible. It's about the interplay of, of light and surface. So then it becomes about the integration of light and lighting and architecture. You know, and how we're integrating. You know, the most beautiful light fitting to me is a cove because mm. it's the per perfect marriage of of light and architecture. Um, so that if we go and if we get involved in the project too late in the day, then often you know we're asking the architect to aren't to redraw um, design packages, for example. So and that becomes a hindrance and an imposition on people. So ideally, we want to get involved before the design packages are done. The reality is we probably need to be about half a step behind the architect and or interior designer, right? Because light, you know, has to um, it has to sort of be sub subordinate to you know, the architecture and the interior design of the space, we're there to highlight it. So if we don't know what we're lighting, then it's difficult to light something. Yeah. Um, so I didn't want to be half a step behind. Often it's nice to get involved um, relatively early on. Um, you know, it'd be great, especially on large public realm schemes, for example, great to get involved at feasibility stage because we can start to look at what is possible. We can start to influence budgets because inevitably there's never enough money. Um, so if we can get involved and influence those budgets much earlier, but I think it's very easy then to get carried away and start designing at a very early stage and you just burn fee. So I think it's more important to establish a hierarchy and a strategy within the design mm. at an early stage and then just drop out, you know, let the design team do what they need to do and then come back in a little bit later on when there's more tangible stuff to think about light and lighting. And, uh, and, and that pretty leads on to one of the kind of key messages that, that we as lighting designers have. It isn't, about what you're lighting when you think about light. It is not, I am going to light that wall or that arch. It's not what, it's why. Yeah. It's the journey, it's the narrative. And this goes, you know, it harks back to the customer service because if you want to get people to understand the narrative, then the design has a level of authenticity. And if you have authenticity, it's a lot easier to argue and sell your design, argue for your design and sell your design. So, you know, at an early stage in a project, we want to be establishing well, what do we want to light? You know, so, mm. or, you know, why are we lighting the space? What do we want the reactions to be? And then only later on in the project am I really asking the question, how? How am I lighting it? Is it with down lights? Is it with up lights? Is it with a chandelier? You know, first of all, I want to establish the hierarchy of the space. What's important and why? Yeah. Um, and, and I think when you start on that journey, and you do this in architecture, this is the thing. So it, 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 lighting just you know, it's a smaller discipline that follows that same design process. It is not about coming in at stage three or four 
and just saying, you know, well, how am I lighting it? I'm going, I'm putting some down lights in. <laughs> you know, put some wall lights over there. Um, it's much more um, uh, creative than that, I guess. Right. You know, it's, it's light is this wonderfully intangible substance. Uh, it's part psychology, part sociology, part science, part creativity. Um, and I think when you blend those disciplines with light, you can really impact. So we want to get involved as, say, as early as possible, but not burn the fee. Yeah. Um, you've, you've got, if it will, you've expanded the business into a number of different regions, you know, in Asia and Bangkok. You've got the office in Beirut and in the UAE, um, also in the US. How... How have you been able to do that and what have been the obstacles in kind of becoming international? Um, money. <laughs> the <laughs> obstacle. Um, it costs whatever, whatever we think it's going to cost to expand. Uh, it's usually three times the, right. the cost. Wow. Uh, it's a big investment. It's a big hole you see going in one direction mm. for a long time. Um, the truth is people are the catalyst for it you know in almost every instance that we've expanded or, or opened an office um it's been because we found somebody we really liked and we thought this person would be really good in our business they've got a lot of talent i wonder if i could sort of mentor them into a head of design business development role in a small team yeah uh, and then sort of evolve it onwards and um, um, particularly in Dubai, that's been incredibly successful. My MD there has achieved a huge amount in a relatively short space of time. Uh, he was very hungry. He was a great person. He was perfect for us as a business. Um, so it was about finding the right people. And I think if you find the right people, then you build a team mm. around them. Um, but you've got to be prepared to not make any money out of it for a fair while right. uh, whilst relationships are being built. And that sometimes means making commercial decisions on projects. It sometimes means... Um, you know, being out of pocket for a bit, but you know, it's got a long-term aim. Have there been any kind of uh, steep learning curves in terms of dealing with the different cultures of the way that place, different places do business? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, for sure. You know, the, the, the Middle East has its own unique culture and way of doing business. And mm. um, whilst it is very, very respectful, um, sometimes in the Middle East, the contract isn't worth the paper it's written on. You know, it's, it's much more about a handshake and trust, uh, for sure. And there are certain areas of the world, I'll be politically correct about this, but there are certain areas of the world where brown envelopes still prevail, and that's not something we want to entertain. Yeah. So I think it's been very difficult when someone sat opposite me saying, well, now you have to give me money, um, you know, or you know, if, if you specify our products, and we'll give you this. You know, it's not how we work as a as a business. So, I think avoiding those has been very difficult. I think one of the biggest challenges is finding the right people for the right roles. You know, there's only so much you can read from somebody's CV. It's always a lottery until a member of staff starts. Ultimately, yeah. um, and in in certain cultures, it's been difficult finding the right the right people. In the US, actually, it's, it's incredibly incredibly difficult finding the right kind of designers that we like um, that will fit within our budgets as well. You know, we, we have a budget. We, I, I liken it into um, kind of budget a football team has and that you pay your best players the most money and you're, you're, you're not so talented um, players the least money and everybody gets paid relative. Yeah. So we, won't, we will not break that pay scale as a business because I think it's disrespectful to my team. Yeah, but then that, that in some areas limits what we are or willing to spend um, on um, uh, members of staff locally. So it's 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 that's been a real challenge, if I'm honest with you. Does the decision to start an office um, is there normally like a, a a project that kicks it off, or is it more to do with like you find the right people there and you think that there's a there's a there's a, an entry point into a market here that would be wise for us to kind of become either early adopters or to, to crack into? Yeah, I think it's all of the above, actually. You know, sometimes it's about find, just finding the right person. You know, the, mm. As it happened in Dubai, we had two or three projects and I was flying backwards and forwards thinking, wow, there's a market here. Why, can't, why, why aren't we doing more? And yeah. then Mark, the MD, on my MD there, came onto the market 
I thought it was perfect fit. You know, it was just the right it was serendipity, really, right person, right place, right time. Um, so we went for it. Um, so you know, it, it is sometimes it's about having projects, and, and sometimes it's about seeing you're looking at a marketplace and thinking, yeah, there's there is potential for us there. There are some markets that we've looked at. Uh, where I've actually said, no, I don't think it's right for us. Mm. You know, China is one that where actually I, for us as a business, I don't think it's right. Um, you know, I, I'm happy to do, do lots of work in China, but I don't see us opening an office there um, at any point in the future. I'd never say never, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I just don't think it's, it's quite the right marketplace for us as a, as a business. And some businesses will go there and thrive. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's a kind of complex mix of factors, I suppose. Um, and when and when you set up a new uh, a new location, uh, do they become kind of completely independent businesses in and of their own selves, or do you, there's a, is there like an overarching holdings company that kind of owns a piece of all of these, or how do you structure it? Yeah, again, both actually. So we you know we have a, a holding company. I also have in the US two companies. We have an office in Miami, but I have a holding company in Delaware. Right. I'm not going to lie. I couldn't even tell you where Delaware is on a map. So apologies <laughs> to anybody who lives in Delaware. Um, but it's just the way it works for, for various reasons in the US. Um, yeah. But yes, no, we have, a, we have a parent company that owns all of the other entities. We also have two other companies that are not nulti um, companies. We have a company called Studio N in the Middle East as well. And uh, in the UK, we have a company called Nulti Bespoke, which is a custom chandelier um, manufacturer. So they're all owned by an umbrella company. Um, but they are all their own individual identities, also individual entities. They're their own cost center. Yep. They're all expected to, to make their own money and, and have, um, stand on their own two feet. The wonderful thing about it, of course, is if we pick up a project in Bangkok and it's one of those jobs where they need a project delivered in four weeks, then we can pull on resources from other offices to make sure. So we can, if we need to, essentially run a sort of 18-hour work day from you know from Bangkok all the way through to Miami if we absolutely had to kind of pass the baton uh, we've never really had to do that but we certainly shared projects amongst sort of two offices um, where need be mm. um, and so it's, it's proved to be very useful actually um, and we tend to split the project according to wherever the lead consultant is so if we're working with an architectural practice that's based in London irrespective of where in the world that project is it'll be our London team that, that right works on it um, except when it goes to site and then the nearest office will do the site visits because it's less time on an airplane and i think that's good for, for all of us to be spending less time on airplanes yeah um so it, it tends to be that so in london we're working on projects in the middle east you know out of the london office despite having an office in the middle east and likewise the guys in the middle east are working on a couple of projects in europe because they are with um, middle eastern based lead consultants so um, you know, we've had to be very well structured about that. Um, the key to getting it right is to make sure that everybody in the group signs up to the same common goal and the same objectives. Um, and, and that's where, where we are really. And that's the kind of journey that we're on, I suppose. Mm. It, many sort of large scale architecture practices I've spoken to in the past have often uh, spoken about the benefits of having international offices because it allows um, has, has allowed them to weather economic storms rather well. Often, mm -hmm. you know, often, you know, if, if London economy is doing bad or European, then often somewhere in China has got projects or somewhere in the Middle East. Is, has that ever been the case for you guys? Have you found that? Or, you know, yeah. obviously and as, as well, you know, what we're gearing up to for the rest of 2020 <laughs> and 2021 with all these unknowns. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure why I'm laughing about it. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, we're only 10 years old. Yeah. Know, so we've only really been through one recession as a business. Um, but yes, we were able to pass projects to keep the team, um, our teams busy. Um, so that, that worked very well. As a business that invests very heavily in staff, and, you know, if we're taking designers to meetings and training, 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 then I don't really want to let people go. Yeah. You know, I mean, touch wood, we've, in 10 years, we've once had to make a couple of people redundant, mm. which was at the beginning of the last recession. Um, as we've sort of got into the current um, pandemic, it's a bit different because, well, the whole world is screwed right now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm looking at it thinking, well, there isn't, as far as I can tell, any economy anywhere that's doing all right. 
And if there was, we'd probably be opening an office there pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, what we are seeing, of course, you know, there is a, it does feel like there's a bit of an upturn in the Middle East at the moment, for sure. Um, so we're certainly tendering a lot of work uh, out there, and, and fingers crossed that continues. Um, so it's a challenge right now mm. to a portion projects. Um, I think, you know, there's a bit of a hiatus on growth, for sure, for us. Yeah. You know, we're not looking to grow as aggressively as we have done previously, but, you know, we've adjusted our sort of targets for the next year to keep our nose ahead and above the water, you know, and mm. if, if, we, if we do that, we'll have done very, very well. I think you know, there's a lot of us are going to struggle. I think as an industry, as a lighting industry and as a wider construction industry, we do not talk about it enough because business is dirty. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there struggling on their own and, and, it, and it's not easy for us, you know, and, it, and I would love there to be more open conversation about how people are dealing with it mm. because furlough is not the answer. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. How, how, have you, how have you guys been adapting your way, your modes of operating over yeah. the last few months? Well, I miss my team. We're all working from home. I've, I've been in the office for uh, the last sort of two or three weeks along with some of my admin team. But um, you're in the I office. Really, you're in the office right now. I am in the one of the meeting rooms right now. Ah, okay. Yes. <laughs> I was I was I was wondering if all of that. If you've got that beautiful gold room, gold hall, yeah. yeah. Which room in the house is that? <laughs> Um, no, we moved offices. By <laughs> I signed a lease on a new office in February, and um, oh. that was terrible timing. But it's an old bank, or basically, you know, in Waterloo, Westminster, um, in the end of Westminster Bridge, and uh, it's an old bank. So uh, this is the old bank vault that I'm currently in. Fantastic. Um, so we painted it gold uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but no, um, to answer your question, adjusting to life is hard. Mm. You know, we went into lockdown pretty busy. Um, and I pushed my team, challenged my team to do as much as we could as a practice to give back to yeah. our industry. So we immediately, within a week of lockdown, launched an eight-part CPD and seminar um, sort of program. We gave two seminars a week uh, to anyone that would listen. Um, and they're out there. And I think at you know, one point we had six or 700 people attend. So that was great. Um, we produced things like children's worksheets for people. Um, we hosted gin and tonic tasting nights. We, you know, virtual GNT nights. We hosted drawing classes. You know, we did lots and lots of stuff as, just to reach out to the community. Actually, at one point, we even hosted sort of mental health events. You know, health and well-being events. Um, we got some some really good sort of relationship counsellors to come and talk on a Zoom call to you know a bunch of our clients. Mm. We hosted a three-part um, sort of business welfare um, a series of seminars as well. Again, they were open to anybody that wanted to. Um, and it was all about giving back. And for me, I think uh, the, the, the kind of lockdown period has, been, has not been about being competitive and um, kind of trying to get one up on each other. I think it's been about giving back as, to the industry and just saying, you know what, guys, we're all in this together. Yeah. Um, and frankly, the truth is, it, the way the, the synergy works between competition and, and uh, clients alike, we all need each other. Yeah. Because we all need to be promoting the industry we work with them. Absolutely. So to help each other is, is, is a godsend, you know. Um, in our new office, we've just let free of charge some space to some interior designers because they were, they were homeless. So we, we said, you know, come, come and live here for a bit. So anything we can do to help people, I think right now is, um, is, is the right, the right thing. Um, it is a tough time and I don't think we are at the bottom of that curve. I think we're all having to adjust daily. Mm. Um, you know, teams has been on one hand great, but on the other hand, horrible. Yeah. Because you know, you're always on as it were, people can always contact you. Or Zoom, I suppose. Um, and every day that we all work from team, the business culture deviates a little bit. Certainly yeah. for me, because the culture of this business is about collaboration. It's about the noise in the office. It's about sharing ideas. It's about those chance meetings in a corridor where somebody says, oh, I like that sample, or I like that, and you have those chance conversations. Um, and you don't have that online. Everything has to be contrived. I'll book a meeting in and we'll you know, have a chat through this project. 
Yeah. You know, you don't get to see the sales rep that's brought a sample in for somebody else on another project. And you think, oh, I like that. That would actually work quite well on, on you know, so it's those chance encounters um, that are kind of critical to the uh, evolution of creativity, I think. Mm. And uh, it's all well and good saying we all want to work from, you know, from home and you know, live on teams. But I think long term, there will probably be, it will, it will probably be detrimental to our industry. Yeah. I really do. I think you know, we've got to get back to working collaboratively together in, in those spaces. Um, but quite when that will be, who knows? Has it had um, a big impact on some of your clients? And how yes. Yeah. I mean, we've seen projects go on hold. We've seen much loved clients that have been, you know, businesses for years suddenly laid off overnight. Mm. Um, we've seen budgets you know, drastically reduced on, on projects. So it's a, it, uh, at no point has it had a positive impact <laughs> <laughs> you know, on project work, that's for sure. Um, but I suspect that, that there will be positive elements that come out of it yeah. in the long term. You know, I think the idea of just sort of herding uh, people into smaller and smaller office spaces you know, is going to go. I think businesses are going to be having long, hard thinks about how they treat the staff and you know, um, look after the staff in the workplace. I think there's going to be a huge revolution coming in public realm as we lose a lot of retail and a lot of people don't necessarily need to be in city centers anymore. There's going to be a lot of sort of retail estate sitting open. Um, we're likely to move towards a kind of a shift working pattern, I suspect, which means, you know, uh, the use of space after hours, after daylight hours is, is also going to change. Actually, as a lighting designer, I think long term, there's some wonderful prospects there because there's going to be a lot of, you know, a lot of focus on health and wellness and, and pace making. Um, but I think that will take years, not months. Uh, you know, and um, I think it's about riding that storm out between now and then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know many architects and designers that I've been speaking to um, have, have been doing lots of different things to, to, to try and encourage that, you know, that element of spontaneity and that kind of yeah. communication with staff and, and often lots of team members are dealing with stuff that you don't necessarily know about and, you know, working in uncomfortable conditions and, um, and all sorts of other things. How have you been um, looking after your team or how, how have you found being able to do that as a, as a leader? Yeah, it's tough. It's really hard because you're not seeing somebody every day and you really don't know what their sort of state of mind is. Yeah. You don't really know how busy they are. You know, we haven't got everything right. You know, we found a couple of members of our team have been overworked. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, we've had to really look at the way that we are communicating on a daily basis with people and checking in on a daily basis uh, with people. We do a daily team call. The team then splits into smaller teams and that happens every day. Um, we've had to offer our, well, so had we, we've offered our teams things like therapy sessions if they want them. Yeah. Um, you know, so um, we've done sort of everything we possibly can to look after people's sort of health and, and well-being through what is a very difficult time. Yeah. Um, but there is a limit to what we can do. Mm. Um, and there is also a limit to the money we can invest in that because priority one right now, whether we like it or not, is to get the ship through the storm, you know, and it, it, you know, it's a sort of horrible analogy, but as I said to everybody, when we went into lockdown, you know, it's like being on a kind of pirate ship, uh, you know, sailing through choppy waters and there's water coming on board. And right now we're all bailing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it just make sure we can sail through that storm. Um, and, uh, and that's what we're doing. So we're doing everything we can to, to be there for the team. The yeah. team are also in turn doing everything they can to be there for the business and support the business. Um, but you know, I've never been a great believer in long distance relationships <laughs> <laughs> and it does feel a bit like I've, I mean, I've got a long distance relationship with 50 people at the moment. So, uh, yeah. you know, I'd, uh, I'd like, I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to see my team in the flesh sooner rather than later. Fantastic. Fantastic. And any, any, anything exciting planned for the rest of 2020 or 21? Oh gosh. Well, I'd like to get out of the UK at some point. If <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for, for us, well, you've business. got, you've got a good selection of places to visit here. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, for us as a business, um, 
taking the lease on the new office in, in say, Waterloo, is, is, um, for us, it was a bit of a coming of age um, scenario, really. It's got a, a really lovely um, sort of um, multi-purpose space. And the idea was for us to run a, sort of a host of not necessarily lighting design related, but design industry, construction industry related um, topics and you know, seminars, um, whether that's on business or health and well-being or on you know, the future of architecture or retail or, or whatever it yeah. was. But we really wanted that to happen. And I, I kind of hope we get back to it. But obviously with social distancing, I suspect that's not going to be happening anytime soon. So I think for me, if I'm honest, the challenge for 2020 is to get through 2020. Yeah. Um, see where we as a business uh, land come 2021 uh, and then you know hopefully push on from there I think the government is not doing any of us any favours though at the moment so um, it's, it's going to be a tough time ahead uh, I think it's an opportunity for us as an industry to be there for each other absolutely um, and I think it's you know uh, it's up to us as an industry to sort of really try and drive the market out of this mess as well yeah um, you know, so that means not dropping fees, you know, not, not becoming so aggressive that we're losing money, for example, or, or uh, providing poor service. I think we as an industry have got to understand that we are prof- a professional um, and there's a professional respect for each other. And I think we've all got to do the best that we can to ensure that we as an industry come out of it with as much dignity and pride and work as possible. Yeah, absolutely. That's the I think. I think that's the, the perfect place for us to to <laughs> conclude. And Paul, thank you so much for yeah, your absolutely, pod- uh, absolutely welcome. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely f- fascinating, insightful, and you know very transparent as well. And in in such a wealth of experience and expertise that you've got, and the story behind um, Nulty Design. So thank you once again. Ah, pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.